tell a few stories about myself for those of you that don't know me very well. I uh, lived here in this town for about 10 years, uh, first working with the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice out on the land out uh, by Graham. And then I left the coalition in 1998 to work full time for the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, an international organization trying to step the arms trying to stop the arms race from moving into the heavens. But I grew up in a military family and moved all over the world as a young boy, living in different places in the United States and uh, throughout Europe. And it was in that experience that I learned that everywhere I went, that people were essentially the same. It didn't matter that they spoke a different language, that they looked different, that they ate differently. But everywhere I went, I learned that people really loved their children, they loved to laugh, they loved to have a good time, and they had hopes for the future so that the future generations could flourish as they had in their time. And so I never really, as I came back to the United States, never really considered myself uh, an American per se. I always saw myself as something other, and I didn't quite always fit in exactly with the normal uh, way of being in this country. But that doesn't always mean that you have everything figured out because you're, you know, having tendencies in a certain direction. And so in spite of the fact that I had these positive tendencies, I still uh, worked on the Nixon campaign in 1968. <laughs> Living up in the panhandle of Florida, you know, when I go other places and I tell this story, I, <clears throat> you all know this about the panhandle of Florida, but in most places they don't. I say, you know, it's so conservative there, they call, call it Lower Alabama. <clears throat> but in fact, it was. Uh, Fort Walton Beach, Eglin Air Force Base, my dad was stationed on that base. And I did such a good job working on the Nixon campaign that one of my teachers in school said, you know, you're the reason I voted for Richard Nixon. And they had a fish fry fundraiser for Nixon, and they invited me as a reward for my hard work to come and sit at the head table along with a senator that was there as the guest speaker that evening. He recently died. You've probably heard of the guy, Senator Strom Thurmond from South Carolina. <laughs> so that's how I got my political organizing start. <laughs> and then in 1971, I tried to join the Air Force during the Vietnam War, and I actually flunked my induction physical because of an old high school football injury. And so I had to get a waiver to get into the military when most people were trying to get out because of the war. And after my training, I was sent to a base, Travis Air Force Base in California, airlift base for the war in Vietnam. GIs would come from all over America and get on the planes and go to Vietnam. And when the planes came back, they brought the uh, body bags of the dead soldiers. So on the weekends, on the weekends, about 10 people are standing out in front of the gate holding signs almost every weekend. And I can hear them now. You think it does any good? You think we're ever going to stop this war? You think anybody's paying any attention to us? And little did they know that we had 15,000 GIs permanently stationed on our base, in addition to the thousands that came on and off the base, getting on the planes to go to Vietnam and returning. And little did they know that we would talk about them in the chow hall, in the barracks at night, on the job during the day. We would talk about those few people outside the gate endlessly. And they helped change my life and turn me into a peace activist. And so I want to remind people that as we stand out doing our thing, we often begin to doubt ourselves. But you know, 
we've all been trained, <clears throat> as our minds have been colonized by the system we live in, to think in a kind of mechanized way. We want everything com computerized and calculated and on paper and dissected. Linear thinking, it's called, right? But sometimes you just have to plant seeds and water seeds and know in your heart of hearts that they'll grow. And you leave it to that and you get on with your business. Well, I'm going to talk tonight about an illusion, a mythology called America. Something that doesn't really exist, but that we've all been uh, colonized, mentally colonized as a people to believe in this illusion and this mythology called America. So if we want to understand where we as a people in the United States of America today are headed as a nation, I think it's important that we start with the creation of America. And to do that, we have to go back and look at the cloth. Think of America as cloth. And think of the threads that wove the cloth of America together. The threads of genocide of the native people in America. The threads of the introduction of slavery in America. This is the cloth of America, a cloth that was created with genocide and violence. This is who we are as a people in America today. You all remember the story of Valley Forge, don't you? At the time of the American Revolution, the brave American revolutionaries throwing the British out at Valley Forge in the winter, huddling around fires, freezing, and General Washington on his white horse riding through the camp, telling the soldiers to hang on. I know you don't have any food. I know you don't have any clothes and blankets. But hang on. Don't worry. We'll pay you when, the, when we win. Hang on. Oh, it's a famous story in the American mythology. It's an inspiring story in the American mythology. But what we don't know is that the, con the contractors had been awarded funds by the Continental Congress to feed and clothe this peasant army. But the contractors ripped off the army, not supplying what they had been paid to do. The corruption was there at the very first day, even before the successful American Revolution. And then you remember, finally, the war was won. And they created this new shining document, a model to the world, the Constitution, that said only white men who own land could vote. And many of those revolutionary soldiers had been peasant farmers and peasant laborers who now, under the new Constitution, could not vote. Some of the farmers, though, had land, and they went back to farm their land and looked forward to the day that they could vote. But then new taxes were imposed, the whiskey tax and other taxes, making it impossible for these revolutionary soldiers, farmers, to pay their taxes, and then they began to lose their land and lose their right to vote. They raised the rebellion, Shays' Rebellion, saying, what happened to the revolution? We've been betrayed. And then you heard about the great Indian wars in America in the 1860s, the Lakota, out in the Badlands, in the Black Hills of South Dakota. You heard about that. And you heard about the Indian called Crazy Horse. You heard about him, the great warrior who led uh, the Lakota people to victory at Custer's Last Stand. But you don't know this part of that story. You don't know that the Indians were slowly but surely over about 20 years uh, in that region brought on to the reservations. But a few of them held out. Crazy Horse and his band and a few others held out 
against the white man. But even then, the buffalo were being destroyed. With the finding of gold in the Black Hills, more and more white people coming, more army brought in to clear the path for the whites to take over the sacred Black Hills, violating treaties, killing the deer and the antelope and the other game that the Indians depended on for survival. And Crazy Horse and his band were finding it hard to survive. And they even had to go and surrender to the army and to go on the reservation. And when he and his band, one of the very last to go onto the reservation, when they went and surrendered, they had to turn over their horses and their guns. And as they did that, they no longer had the ability to hunt the buffalo anymore, to hunt deer or anything else. They became dependent on the federal government, the reservation head, the white man in charge of the reservation. They became dependent on him to hand them stuff to live on, flour with bugs in it, bacon that was rancid and rotting, blankets that were made of the thinnest cloth that would fall apart before the winter was over. The contractors were getting the money from the government to deliver these supplies to the Indians, but the contractors began to cheat and steal. Corruption was endemic in this time. But the contractors also said, you know, that war was great for us. And now that even crazy horses on the reservation, what are we going to do for money now? And so they started a public relations campaign all over America in the biggest newspapers in the country. They had artists do renderings of Crazy Horse and his band in rebellion, leaving the reservation, going out and killing civilians, white civilians throughout the region, when in fact he was sitting on his teepee on the reservation without a gun to call his own. And the federal government was swung into action and appropriated more money for the contractors to supply the additional troops that were sent to the Indian territories to stop the new rebellion from, of Crazy Horse. The corruption took over. And this is the story that we see in Iraq today. $5.4 billion dollars of your money every month being stolen from the people by Halliburton and Bechtel. And now these same weapons corporations, contractors, today saying we need Star Wars, weapons in the heavens, in order to protect us from who and from what. They say that Star Wars will be the largest industrial project in the history of the planet Earth, costing so much money, so much money that we can't afford it with the enormous $500 billion plus that we spend on the military today. In this planning document called Vision for 2020 put out by the United States Space Command, they talk about how the United States will control space, how we will dominate space, and how we, the United States, will deny other countries access to space. And in fact, at their headquarters building in Colorado at Peterson Air Force Base, they have their slogan, their logo on the headquarters building, Master of Space. And they wear that as a patch on their uniform as well. And now they are talking about developing anti-satellite weapons in space to destroy other countries satellites so that we, the United States, will control everything. And at this very moment, the Bush administration is deploying so-called missile defense interceptors at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, in Fort Greeley in Alaska, even though they have yet to prove successful in the testing program. There is so much corruption and lying going on within this whole Star Wars testing program that the contractors are now convincing the Pentagon that they have to make everything secret. 
And so the Bush administration is now announcing that all the future tests of the Star Wars program will be done in secrecy. And even industry publications like Space News, and even the newspaper in Colorado Springs, a slave to the military industrial complex, is complaining that the secrecy is getting so great that even they can't get any information about what's going on anymore. We know today that space coordinates all warfare on the Earth. The Iraq war is, was coordinated by 50 military satellites. So if you have your satellites in space, and you control space, and you deny other countries access to space, you win all the wars on the Earth below. They call this full spectrum dominance. The U.S. will dominate conflict at every level, on the ground with our conventional military, the air with our Air Force, and space with the U.S. Space Command. And new things, new satellites are being developed today to give them what they call persistent surveillance, the ability to hear everything and see everything on the Earth below. Now something that I think most people in Florida should be interested in is another Bush program called Project Prometheus. This is what they call the nuclear rocket. Nuclear rocket with nuclear reactors for engines. It's going to be launched from Cape Canaveral. Imagine them blowing up on launch. Rockets traditionally have a 10 to 25 percent failure rate. And now they're talking about a whole host of new nuclear launches because they want to have nuclear powered mining colonies on the moon and Mars. You might have remember a year or so ago Bush announcing that we're going back to the moon, and we're going on to Mars. This whole program is going to be totally nuclearized. Now these aerospace corporations or contractors say, look, we have to be realistic. We have to be good citizens. We have to provide a funding source. We know that budgets are tight in the United States right now. And so they've come forward with their funding source for all this nuclearization and weaponization of space. They call them the entitlement programs. And in an editorial in the space news industry publication, Recently, they talked about how they are going to send their lobbyists to Washington to defund the entitlement programs so the money can be moved into the space projects. Now, let's just for a moment review what these entitlement programs are. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and what's left of the welfare program after Clinton got finished with it. These are the programs that the contractors are identifying for extinction. And so friends, the message is that you, the American people, are now the Indians. And you will be brought on to the reservation system. Now you know that the income, income gap in America is widening dramatically. They say at the top, think of the pyramid, at the top of the pyramid are 29,000 people. And at the bottom of the pyramid, these 29,000 own the equivalent wealth of 96 million Americans at the bottom. 29,000 at the top, 96 million at the bottom. Last Sunday I spoke at a Unitarian church in Melbourne. A young student came up to me afterwards and uh, commented about this particular statistic. And he said, you know, I, uh, I've decided after hearing your talk that I'm going to go and work to change these 29,000 at the top. I said, well, good luck to you. <laughs> I said, I'm going to go out and try to organize the 96 million. I think we'll have more success if we do that. But you know, I think you all are aware, you've probably heard, that the jobs are moving out of America, right? Where I live now in Maine, which I want to invite all of you to come, especially this time of year, it's quite lovely there. It's very glistening and just a, just a short aside, you know those little uh, things you pick up and shake and, they, and the snow goes all over them? Well, right before we came here for Christmas, I looked out the window and there it was in real. 
the wind was blowing and the snow was swirling, just like when you shake it up and it's flying all over. It was the most beautiful picture, and it was right there just outside my window. It was lovely. But in our state of Maine, what I've learned since I moved there is that the textile industry is gone. The shoe industry is gone. And all the other major industrial industries, even the paper mills, which Maine has always been famous for, are closing down and moving to the third world. And so what's the job growth in Maine besides McDonald's? It's the military industrial complex. And in the state of Maine, the number one export product of the state of Maine is weapons. Just as the number one industrial export product of America today is weapons. And friends, when weapons are your number one industrial export, what is your global marketing strategy? How are you going to market your product? And so jobs are moving overseas. The corporations don't care about this country anymore. Their job is to maximize profits globally. Why pay somebody $15, $20 an hour here when you can go somewhere else and pay them 50 cents a day? It makes sense, right? So that's what's going on. And the Iraq war, of course, is a manifestation of that. It's a manifestation of corporate control of resources around the world. Because that's what we're moving into now. Oil is a diminishing resource. Water is a diminishing resource on this earth. And the corporations are now moving to control these resources. And they're going to do it any way that they have to. They will kill as many people as they have to to do it. Now we're told that as soon as we bring them democracy in Iraq, as soon as we give them that wonderful gift, we're leaving. But the fact of the matter is, we're building 14 what they call enduring bases in Iraq today. And Tony Blair was just over there a week or so ago, and he said he thought we'd be there 10 years at least. I think he's a lot closer than uh, George Bush is on the time frame. But in this new vision that the corporations have for us, it goes like this. We won't have jobs in America anymore. Our number one export is going to be security. There's a part of the world that the Pentagon has identified and they're now calling the gap. The part of the world that is not yet submitted to corporate globalization. And they define the gap as parts of Central America, Central Africa, Central Asia, the Middle East. This is also, coincidentally, the part of the world where oil is. And the Pentagon is saying that they will now close down the big bases in Europe and create new lily pad bases, small little bases throughout the gap allowing us to have little jumping off point, leapfrog points, where we can move quickly to intervene as soon as possible to go in and suppress any opposition to corporate globalization. And they're identifying this new force that they want to create to do this as Leviathan. And they define Leviathan. Leviathan, they say, is Give me your angry 18, 19, 20-year-olds who love to play video games. It's one thing that happens when you defund education in America. You're going to have a lot more angry 18, 19, 20-year-olds who only know to idle their time away playing video games. Give me these young people to be the Leviathan ass kick and force to go into the gap, to take it over, to get them to submit to corporate globalization. That's their new plan. And then following that, something that they say we've successfully done in Iraq, we went in quickly, took over the country, defeated their army, surrendered essentially, ran off. That's Leviathan. 
The part they say we're not yet doing well with is what they call systems administration, what is happening today in Iraq. They say we've got to work on and get better at systems administration. Systems administration, they say, will be the pro council of the empire. They will go into the particular territory in the gap after Leviathan has gone in and taken it over, and CIS-AD, as they like to call it, CIS-AD's job will be to go in and shut it down, to take control of it. And they say, that, they say these forces will never come home. They will never come home. And all of this will be tied together by space technology. Because when you are spread out all over the world, you've got to be able to hear everything, and you have to be able to see everything, and you have to be able to quickly target everything and every place on the Earth. And the only way you can do that is with space technology. And therefore, you have to be able to deny other countries access to space, so that way you will have no rivals in this new world order that I call 21st century feudalism. Well, I know this is not a bright, rosy, beautiful, cheery, happy new year 2005 story. But this is what I think they are saying clearly where they're going today. And like the Indians said, it's wise to put your ears to the tracks and hear the train coming so you can head them off at the pass. And that's our job now that we're the Indians in America too. America, my friends, is addicted to war. Like an alcoholic that has to go back to the bar and and get up to the bar and have another drink and another drink and another drink, America is addicted to war. I want to read uh, two quotes to you. See if you can tell me where this first quote came from, what part of American history it was. I really felt guilty as I applied the torch to huts that were homes of content until we ravagers came spreading desolation everywhere. Our mission here is ostensibly to destroy, but may it not transpire that we pillagers are carelessly sowing the seeds of empire. This was a, a veteran, an American GI. Philippines. George Washington's army in 1779. As they set out to remove the Iroquois civilization from New York State, as Washington moved the empire west of the Mississippi, from the first days, friends, we were to be an empire. They threw the King George out, not because they didn't like empires, they just wanted to run the empire themselves. That was the American Revolution. Now, a more contemporary quote for you. From J July 16th, 2004, reported in the Associated Press, a comment by Captain Will Hickok VI, a relative of the famous Wild Bill Hickok, stationed in Iraq at that time with the Army's elite 9th Cavalry Unit. And this is what he said. This is what I like, just scouting, sitting out here spying, watching out. It's relaxing. It's almost like playing cowboys and Indians. So we've come full circle. We've come full circle in this endless war. And I want to say to you today, 
that we will never, never, never end war. That we will never, 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 never end war until we deal with this addiction and until we begin to talk about jobs in America. Jobs. People in, people in this country, people in this room, since I arrived tonight, since we began eating, I began hearing the stories about St. Francis House, now getting people right out of the hospital because there's no place for them to go other than St. Francis House. People just out of the burn units. These kinds of stories are everywhere in America today. No matter who you talk to, teachers, social workers, you name it. People that fix bridges, no matter what it is, there is no money for anything in America today across 50 states, north, south, east, and west, because America is being defunded from top to bottom. That's America today. And until we look at our soul, until we look at ourselves as a nation in a mirror and look at our collective soul, we will never change anything. I think the time has come that we consider the process of joining a collective 12-step program in America. Hello, my name is America, and I'm addicted to war. Hi, my name is America, and I'm addicted to violence. You know, back in the late 80s, there was a movement sweeping across America called the Economic Conversion Movement. The Soviet Union was dissolving. We no longer had an enemy. We no longer needed to fund this big NATO military alliance that was soaking up hundreds and hundreds of million dollars of your tax dollars every year. And there was a movement in this country talking about the peace dividend. We're going to be able to take that money and now use it for something good in this country. Here in Florida, at that time I was working for the Florida Coalition, we organized an economic conversion conference in Miami. We had the president of the Machinist Union that represents many aerospace weapons contracting workers across the country. The president of the Machinist Union came to speak about economic conversion because they were worried about their jobs. What was going to happen to their jobs now that we're going to have a peace dividend? And so the unions were interested in this idea. It was a growing movement, like a wildfire across the country. And all of a sudden, it was gone, just like that. And what made it disappear? Well, we had a president called King George the I. And he had an important invasion he had to do called Operation Just Cause in Panama. He had to go in and liberate the Pan Panamanian people from this bad guy, Manuel Noriega. And he went in and he bombed the whole damn country. He bombed this one neighborhood in Panama City called El Chirio, a poor people's neighborhood, and burned it to the ground and over 2,000 or more innocent civilians were killed in the fire and in the bombing of Operation Just Cause to go in to get that one bad apple, Manuel Noriega, who had been working for the CIA for a long time. And then right after that, he had to go in and get another one bad guy by the name of Saddam Hussein and chase him out of Kuwait. And that ended the talk about the peace dividend and economic conversion. And the peace movement dropped that effort and had to run out and stand in the streets, changing the signs, if you will, 
Stop the war. No blood for oil. Conversion was gone. The alliance with the unions, gone. The initiative, gone. The alternative vision, gone. Just like that. But one thing we know is that military spending is capital intensive. That means for every million dollars that you spend on military, yes, you do create X number of jobs. But when you look at that same million dollars and you invest it anywhere else, doing anything else, building hospitals, hiring teachers, fixing roads, doing whatever, in every single instance you create more jobs than if you were to put it into military spending. Well, in Maine, I'm now working with Peace Action Maine, a statewide organization. And we've just decided, uh, the Global Network and Peace Action Maine, to create a multi-year campaign around this issue. And I want to share it with you. We're calling it the Healthy Maine Economy, remembering again that our number one export is weapons in Maine. And we have decided to, over several years, begin to create a debate in our state about what's the best way to create jobs as jobs are moving out of our state like crazy. And also to raise the moral and ethical question, what does it say about us as a state when weapons are our number one export product? What does it say about our soul? And we want people to ponder those questions and move into action. And the first thing we did was to go to a statewide artist organization and ask these artists to create images of conversion of the military industrial complex. C create the pictures so that we can take them out and show people what it looks like. Because not everybody is intellectually oriented. Some people, like myself, are visual people. And if they see something, they can grab it much easier. And so these artists have agreed to do this. And they are now undertaking this effort to create these images. And the University of Southern Maine in Portland has agreed in their art gallery to display these pictures from this coming April through August, these images. And this will initiate our campaign. And we're now getting libraries and other colleges in the state that are going to also put these images in galleries across the state of Maine. And we're now working on creating a, a presentation that we're going to take out to virtually every community group that we can identify in the state over the several years to ask people, how do you want your tax dollars to be spent? And Peace Action is now incorporating this theme into every single bit of work it does. Their annual peace supper that they do every February that draws about 400 people their speaker this year is going to talk about the need for economic conversion. The question, of course, is why can't our tax dollars, there are dollars, why can't they be used to build rail cars starting down in Key West and having trains go all the way to the state of Maine, up and down both coasts of America and in and out throughout the country, getting us out of our cars, lessening air pollution, and creating massive numbers of jobs, creating a whole new industry, a national rail system. Why can't we be building windmills? In the state of Maine, up in northern Maine, they're now creating a windmill farm that's going to supply, they say, electricity for 25,000 homes. But the windmills are going to be built in Denmark. At the same time, workers are being laid off at Bath Ironworks in Maine. Why can't they be building windmills? And why in the state of Florida, for God's name, where there's so much sun, why can't our tax dollars be used to create solar energy systems for every house and business in the state of Florida, and in Arizona, and New Mexico, and in California, and all across this country? Why can't that be done with our tax dollars? Yeah, right. 
He's a blind man. You know, I think it's like anything else. If you don't make a demand, you don't have a chance for a response. The people are looking for answers. The people are not stupid. I know a lot of people are frustrated with the American people right now. But they're not stupid. They are not stupid. Cesar Chavez, one time, I heard him say this. He heard an organizer talking, calling the people stupid. And Caesar turned to him and said, he was, this was a union organizer. He turned to this organizer and said, you want the people to follow you? If they ever heard you calling them stupid, do you think they would follow you anywhere? And so we have to look at how we are as organizers and how we talk about the public, the people, those stupid people in red states, right? Or even in blue states, too. <laughs> so we have to really look at that if we ever want people to listen to what we have to say. Because we have a lot to say, and people are looking for answers. They're looking for direction. They're looking for leadership. And if we don't make a political demand, they're not going to get that kind of leadership that we need. And so again, this is our job in this coming period in America, to pull off the veil, off the illusion of America. I think the time has come to tell the story, the true story about America, that July 4th never happened. We never had the revolution. Every July 4th, go and cook your hot dogs and your hamburgers and celebrate the Independence Day, but it never happened. We replaced one dictatorship with another. We have an oligarchy in this country, and we've had it since the beginning. But it's very slick, and it's very sophisticated. But we have that today, running the show, lying to the people, corruption. We have to pull the veil off the illusion of America and provide people with an alternative vision that meets their reality and meets their need to take care of their families and to give hope for the future generations. So we don't need to just oppose war, friends. We also have to provide the transformative vision for the future. And if we do that, then maybe, just maybe, we'll get out from behind the eight ball. <laughs> The way we've been doing it, the way we've been organizing and fighting the system hasn't been working. What should we do? Well, if you don't mind me telling another story about Crazy Horse. The, uh, upon their first contact with the white man, you know, they started bringing whiskey. And people never had whiskey before. And they had a real bad reaction to it, physically. They went crazy. They couldn't handle it. And on this one occasion, they were to have a buffalo hunt the next day. And it was a sacred practice whenever you were going to have a buffalo hunt. The night before, you always had a dance to thank the buffalo, to thank Mother Earth for all that they gave to sustain the people. That connection was strong, and you honored it in a spiritual way. Well, they were so, not, not everyone, but enough of the tribe was so drunk and devastated by this whiskey, they couldn't do the, uh, the dance. And so when they went off to hunt buffalo, they had a broken heart because they had just broken hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years of tradition. And they were just devastated emotionally from that experience. And so what I realized is that the white man was capable of destroying everything. They didn't just want their land. They wanted to destroy them as people, as culture. 
completely destroy everything. And what I see today in Iraq, for example, and in parts of America, I see the same MO. You know, they say every criminal has an MO, a modus operandi. And when, if you accept the notion that our government is run by a criminal syndicate today, that has been in power since the first days, then you would acknowledge that they have an MO, that they operate from an MO. And it's sociological destruction. At the turn of the century before this last one, eight, end of the 1800s, Industrial Revolution had begun in America. The unions were organizing and fighting and gaining some strength, particularly in the Midwest, around Chicago, places like that. And the big corporations, they didn't want to pay these wages. And so what they did, for example, in Chicago, the steel industry, they just shut down the entire steel industry in Chicago. It and created a brand new town called Gary, Indiana. And they moved the industry from Chicago to Gary. And these worker communities, union organized communities, where they had neighborhood centers and they were organized and the people looked out for each other and they, they knew each other and they took care of one another. They were sociologically dismantled, ruined, and the people then had to start all over again. And this is what we see today as industry moves to the south and even beyond out of this country. Destroy the, the basic fabric of the culture of the people. So I think our first strategy has to be to discuss in communities that are now under attack, we have to discuss this modus operandi. The people have to begin to know what is going on and why as they want to privatize Social Security, as they want to get rid of this, as they want to defund education, as they want to shut down clean drinking water. We have to talk about not just the issue, but we have to talk about the why and the what for and the how to. And I think that's the beginning of the way out. And then when you give people that power, that's a returning to them of power when you talk about those aspects of it, I believe. And when you begin to return that power to the people, then they can figure out how to move from there. But I think, let me just say this in, cl in closing on this, on this uh, question. I didn't get to follow it as closely as I would have liked to, but I know yesterday there was the attempt by the House and one senator, I, I think I read on the email, Barbara Boxer from California, to object to the, uh, to the election results. I think this was a big step. It was a very big step for America. Pulling the veil. They pulled the veil. They didn't win, but they pulled the veil. But what happened? What happened when the Democratic Party abandoned what happened when John Kerry abandoned the people that voted for him? What does that say about politics in America and the Democratic Party? And I think we have to also pull the veil off that and name that too in America if we're going to get anywhere and not just be slavishly following along in election after election being told that I'm sorry but there's no other alternative we're gonna have to support them the lesser of two evils if we don't support them we, I've been hearing this for the last five elections when are we gonna begin to say we're not gonna be taken advantage of again <laughs> I think it's fascinating to watch how this whole thing is being played out with China. And what I see is schizophrenia, political schizophrenia. On the one hand, the big corporations are dying to get into China. They want to go in, they want to set up shop, and they want to sell, and they want to buy, and everything else. Walmart's in there big time. You, know, you all know the story. Everywhere you go, everything is made in China, right? But on the other hand, according to the Washington Post, uh, it may have 2000, they said the United States is going to manage China. And we're going to do that by doubling our military presence in the Asian Pacific region. We're going to surround China. 
at Bath Iron Works, just 10 minutes from where I live. They're making the Aegis Destroyer, whose job it is, is to destroy. And they're outfitting the Aegis Destroyer with missile defense systems. And they're going to park it off the coast of China, in Japan, in South Korea, in Taiwan, 90 miles off the coast of mainland China. It's going to make China furious and then throughout the entire Pacific region in that area. So we're beginning a military encirclement of China because we intend to control them as they become this mega power. But on the other hand, some people are now theorizing that the, one of the reasons why we're in Iraq today is not because we use that oil. People are saying we in the United States don't really use that much of Iraqi oil that Japan and China do, and that we are already China's proxy army in Iraq because they hold our debt. We're already doing their bidding, security export. Security export already underway. Leviathan in, China, in Iraq, securing the Iraqi oil so that it can be shipped to China, who holds the cards. Some people say that's what's going on today. Interesting, I think we need to follow that thread and see where it goes. So a real schizophrenia. One other thing that I think is absolutely fascinating, you remember the EP-3 Lockheed Martin spy plane brought down on Henan Island by China a couple years ago? This lumbering, propeller-driven plane flying up along the coast of China, bumping up along its coast. China dispatched fighter jets to go out, escorted it, they kind of hit each other a little bit, escorted it down to Henan Island. I've always said, you know, you know, we got these satellites up there that give you the most incredible reconnaissance of the Earth. Why do you need to send this slow, lumbering airplane, easily detected, easily intercepted by fighter planes up along China's coast? It's almost like somebody is intentionally trying to provoke an incident, isn't it? Oh, but that would never happen. We would never do anything like that. So Bruce, don't go there. Don't think like that. You're getting paranoid now. Well, anyway, this plane was brought down onto Henan Island. Remember that? And they kept the, the, the soldiers, the, the pilots, for a while, and then they sent them back. But then they, China took the plane apart and kept the good stuff and sent the rest of it back in boxes <laughs> and crates. Well, then guess what? Today, on Henan Island, Lockheed Martin is building a naval reconnaissance system for communist China on Henan Island, making money on both sides of the street, ensuring that tit for tat you will create a technological escalation of the arms race in the region, meaning that the United States citizens will soon be informed that China is developing new high-tech military capability that we have to respond to in order to protect the citizens of the United States and the people of the world and the shipping lanes of the world. This is the game they play. This is the game they're playing on us right now. I'm sorry, there's no money to fix that leaky roof on that high school in Gainesville. We've got an arms race to create. Well, let me say this. Uh, the nuclearization of space is a fundamentally crucial issue, not only in Florida, but for everyone because the nuclear industry views space as a new market, just as the weapons industry views space as a new market. So as I said before, nuclear-powered mining colonies on the moon and Mars, nuclear rockets, and most importantly, uh, nuclear power for weapons in space. Now, the current NASA chief, uh, Sean O'Keefe, has just announced his resignation he used to be the secretary of the nuclear navy. His specialty is nuclear power. When he became the NASA head two years, three years ago, he said everything we do at NASA from now on, everything, every mission is going to be dual use. 
meaning there's not going to be any civilian over here and military over here when it comes to space. Every mission is going to be dual use. It's going to be military and civilian at the same time. On every mission, we're going to be testing both. So it, every civilian mission is going to be military as well, basically saying that. Now that's been for years, but they're now acknowledging it, and they're now stepping that up. NASA and the DOE are announcing today that they are expanding production of plutonium. They're going to make more plutonium for space. They're going to need to uh, create new uh, infrastructure within the Department of Energy in order to ramp up, massively ramp up the ability for nuclear power in space. And then finally, let me say this. Some years ago, the Congress of the United States asked a congressional staffer to write the definitive study on this whole space thing. And he did. And his report to the Congress was published in a book by the Air Force Association. And it was called Military Space Forces in the Next 50 Years. And the foreword was signed by John Glenn, Bill Nelson, who at that time was the congressman from Cape Canaveral, went up on the shuttle, as you remember. The, in this book, the congressional staffer tells Congress that if we're going to have space-based lasers orbiting the Earth, knocking out other country satellites, we must have nuclear reactors. We must. And so when we look at this so-called Project Prometheus, the nuclear rocket to, to get us to Mars in half the time, what is the military application of Project Prometheus? That's the question that has to be answered. And there's only one answer to it. Only one answer. Now just for a moment about Mars, because I know you all are dying to know this. You've heard that we're going to go to Mars to look for the origins of life. <laughs> There's an organization called the Mars Society. That it, the president of it is a guy by the name of Robert Zubrin. He's a, pre, uh, he's a, a Lockheed Martin executive. And the Mars Society is lobbying Congress for uh, basically uh, the beginning uh, effort to move our civilization to Mars. The official position of the Mars Society is that the Earth is a rotting, dying, stinking planet. And we have to move off this planet. And they are lobbying Congress to terraform Mars. Now, I want you to learn what terraform is, and then I want you to imagine the cost of terraforming Mars. Terraform means to make it grow green, just like outside here in Florida. Now imagine the cost of moving the civilization and terraforming Mars. But these are the programs that are being promoted by these organizations. And do you know where they get their funding? Mars Society, Planetary Society, the National uh, Societies in Space. These organizations get their funding largely from the military industrial complex, from the aerospace corporations that stand to benefit if the American taxpayers hand over our, their tax dollars. Now, let me just conclude with this little story. I was at Cape Canaveral a few years ago for the Space Congress, an annual conference they have the Air Force, NASA, the weapons corporations. And I went to a Mars workshop, 100 people in just the workshop. And I thought a scientist would get up and talk about the plans for Mars, but it was not. It was the concessionaire from the Kennedy Space Center tourist facility. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, we get two and a half to three million visitors a year at the Kennedy Space Center tourist facility, most of whom are children, who are going to be taxpayers in the next 20 years. And we want to make sure they support everything space. So we are now doing a multi-million dollar renovation of the Space Center on a Mars theme. So this ought to tell you that these people are literally planning into the next generation to ensure that these young people will be so excited about this that they're going to hand over the entire national treasury.